presentation um, on gratitude this evening. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand it off to our moderator this evening, Adam. for bringing two microphones. <laughs> well, good evening once again, everyone, and I echo Trey's welcome to many of you. It's so good to see this room completely full. Uh, first of all, is can everyone hear me okay? Yes. yes. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm very pleased to welcome a good friend, a mentor of mine, uh, Isaac, thank you so much for accepting my invitation to speak to us tonight on the virtue of gratitude. And so with that, I would like to open us up with prayer. And in the spirit of charismatic prayer, I invite you to extend your hands over Isaac as we begin and we bless his talk to, with us today. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for your brother Isaac. Let your Holy Spirit come upon him and be with him tonight as he speaks to us about the virtue of gratitude. We also ask that the Holy Spirit please open up our ears, our minds, and our hearts to hear what Isaac speaks to us tonight. May we leave inspired and be proclaimers of your good news. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. So a little bit about Isaac. Okay. And I do apologize, Isaac. I took this directly off of the Companion's website. <laughs> Let's see what they say. <laughs> Originally from Woodstock, Ontario, Isaac Longworth comes from a large Catholic family with six younger siblings. And apart from a few years of public, public schooling, he was mostly homeschooled. His family was amazing, bringing him to, into the sacraments, catechism classes, and retreats designed to introduce him to the relationship with Christ early on. Before joining the Companions of the Cross, Isaac attended a small liberal arts university in Barry's Bay, Ontario, called Our Lady Seat of Wisdom for two years. Currently, Isaac is completing his studies at Sacred Heart Major Seminary here in Detroit with his fellow companions. Please welcome Isaac. Thanks so much uh, for having me here. Um, is it too cheesy if I'm like, you know, my heart is full of gratitude? For this you know, theme of gratitude. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the companion said some good things about me. Uh, they were all accurate. I do indeed come from a big Catholic family. And uh, I actually, speaking about gratitude, it reminds me, um, growing up we had this tradition in our house. Um, my parents, whenever it was someone's birthday, they would get all of us siblings, all seven of us, to go around the table and say something that we were thankful about uh, the other person. And so some of you might be sitting here thinking, wow, what a charming tradition. What a beautiful way for this family to you know, affirm each other and really pour their hearts out in a vulnerable way. And so my more cynical friends, uh, especially if you have siblings, might be thinking, this is a disaster waiting to happen. <laughs> like, do you know siblings? Like, do you know what they're going to say about you? Anyways. So we get around the table. It's my sister Gianna's birthday. I call her Gigi for short. And so it gets up to my brother Ben, who's kind of the class clown of the family. I don't know if you have one of those in your family. Um, if you don't have one in your family, that means it's you. So, uh, see, we're already learning things about ourselves tonight. Uh, and so Ben gets up there, and he looks at my sister Gigi, and he looks at all of us, and then just with a hint of a smile on his face, he says, Lord... I want to thank you for Gigi, because she really teaches this family patience. <laughs> well, you can imagine how that went. Gigi turns at him, and she's like, that's not a real thank you. That's not a real affirmation. You take that back. He's like, well, I just said it was true. And all the siblings are taking sides. And my mom's getting up. She's like, okay, everyone stop, stop, stop. My dad's just like, why do I even try? So this was our experience of learning about gratitude going up. But I gotta give credit to my parents. Uh, they were trying to instill a habit in us that doesn't naturally come. It's not, uh, it's not easy to be thankful all the time, especially when we live in a culture that very often um, teaches us how to be entitled. 
So when something good happens, at least I can speak for myself, uh, I think, well, of course I'm getting good things. I'm awesome. Why wouldn't I be getting a good thing? This is just kind of how I think. This is just how we tend to treat good things. We might be, don't even think about it. We just assume that it's going to happen. And then heaven forbid if something actually bad happens to me. There's no way I'm going to be grateful on that. The whole time I'm going to be thinking, you know, how could this be happening to me? You know, I don't deserve this. And I'm going to be trying as much as possible to escape that bad situation instead of being grateful in the midst of it. And so what I want to talk to you tonight is about how we are called by God to have a heart of gratitude. We're called by God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So this isn't uh, a nice afterthought by Paul. This is a, a command from God. God's will for us is to be thankful in all circumstances. And that means the good and the bad. Now, this might seem impossible, right? How can I thank God for the bad things in my life, let alone the easy part of thanking God for the good things? Well, God doesn't ask us to do impossible things. He actually gives us the grace to be able to do this. And I want to talk about how we can do that tonight because God wants us to have a life of abundance he wants what's good for us, and he knows because he made us, he knows that when we have a heart of gratitude, when we have a heart that is quick to thank him for things, that will actually be a much more joyful experience for us. That'll lead to a lot of peace and authentic happiness in our lives. So we're going to talk today about three things. How we can be thankful in good times, how we can be thankful in bad times, and how, in all situations, we can have a gratitude that is quite literally out of this world. So first, how do we thank God for the good things? This is the easiest one. So, you know, you should already be doing this, but don't worry if you're not. We'll, we'll get there. Uh, last year, I was in um, Halifax, Nova Scotia. That was where the seminary placed me. Uh, it's on the very eastern part of Canada. And uh, while I was there, because COVID lockdowns were still a thing, uh, there wasn't anything to do indoors, and so I did a lot of hiking. And while I was hiking with a friend of mine that I made out there, in the middle of December, we were talking about New Year's resolutions, because that's what you talk about at the end of December, you're getting ready. We were talking about, you know, what's the stupidest New Year's resolution you've ever heard, and uh, do you even do them? Is this a thing? And so uh, he was telling me that instead of doing New Year's resolutions, at the start of every year, he picks a specific virtue to work on. And last year, he picked gratitude. And he said, it has changed my life. It's changed my life. I'm consciously trying to thank God all the time for the good things that he's done for me. And, and, and it's amazing how it's revolutionized my life. And I thought, that's pretty cool. I'm going to do that. And so I did. But I didn't know where I was going to start. And I found that the first place that I had to start wasn't with things that I began to do. It had to start here. I had to start with a mind change. I had to shift my perspective to realizing that everything that came into my life was a gift from God, was a gift from my loving Father. In James chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Every good gift, every perfect gift, is from above, from the Father of lights. It doesn't say some gifts. It doesn't say the occasional gift. Every gift comes from our Father. And when we have this mentality it's easy to thank him for it. Now, it's easiest to have this mentality when uh, you are getting something that you don't feel like you deserve. So I, I'm quite confident that this has never happened to any of you because, you know, if you're young Catholic professionals, you're professionals. You've never done something like this. But imagine some poor soul who doesn't study for an exam before it happens. I know. You probably can't even imagine such a horrible situation, but imagine it. Try and get yourself into it. And let's say that that paper goes in front of you you look down at it, and you're like, I don't know anything. I don't know anything. I don't even know this word. Like, how am I supposed to answer this? And you shoot up the most desperate prayer from, from your inner soul, right? It just erupts. Lord God, help me pass this exam. And then you pass it. What is your response going to be? You know, it's going to be, praise God, hallelujah, I, I, I passed this exam. And then, almost immediately afterwards, thank you, God. 
Right? It's very easy when we don't think we deserve it. But how about those times when we receive something good and we think to ourselves, well, I actually earned this. I actually did the work for this. So again, to get to the professional status that you're in, whatever field that you're in, you probably did put the work in. You probably worked those extra hours. You pounded the pavement to get that interview. You, uh, you know, did the projects that no one else in the company wanted to do. And now finally, you get that raise, you get that promotion, you get that uh, house maybe, you you be able to start a family, whatever su success looks like. How hard is it to thank God in that? Because deep down there's that lingering little thought, well, maybe I'll thank God in some superficial way, but really, I, I did this myself. I, I, I got this myself. And you don't really have this awareness that it, this too is a gift from God. Because God gave you the intelligence that allowed you to get through school. God gave you this country with its opportunities. God gave you your family and your friends for the support. In fact, the very fact that you're sitting here and you took that last breath you just took, that was a gift from God. The fact that your heart is still beating, that's a gift from God. He holds us in being. He sustains us even now. So everything is a gift from the Lord. And so when we have this mentality in mind, we can actually begin to practice gratitude in our day-to-day. -day. What does that look like? Well, maybe it starts with in the very first thing in the morning, you wake up and you say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, that I have woken up to a new day. Start your day off with Thanksgiving because it will set the tone for the rest of the day. And then throughout the day, I find it helpful to, whenever something good happens to you, thank God right then and there for it, no matter how small it is. You know, thank you, God, for this amazing meal I just had. Thank you, God, that traffic is finally letting up. Thank you, God, that my favorite song just came on the radio. Recognize that everything is a gift from God and thank him for it. I like to do it out loud, actually, because it's forcing my, my lips, my physical mouth to actually move to cement that habit into my mind. And then finally, at the very end of the day, take time to look over the course of your day. Where was God moving? What gifts was he giving you? And if you miss the opportunity to thank him, thank him right then and there. Say, Lord, I'm sorry, I missed this opportunity earlier, but I'm going to thank you now. St. Ignatius Loyola was really big on this, looking over your day and thanking God for what he has done for you. Well, that's the first way, right? It's easy to be thankful in good situations, but what about the bad situations, Isaac? You mentioned that earlier. When are we going to get to that? Well, we're going to get to it right now. It seems pretty counterintuitive to be thanking God for bad things, doesn't it? Like, what does that even look like? You know, thank you, God, for the fact that I lost my job. Like, how, how do I even phrase this? Well, in one sense, it doesn't make a lot of sense to thank God for things that are bad. But the only way that this makes sense is when we think about the fact that in every situation, even in the most painful things, God is working somehow to bring good about it for us. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, Paul writes that God works for the good of those who love him, and for those that are called according to his purpose. In everything, God is working for our good. Now, I want you to hear me on this, because it's really easy to mess this passage up. What I'm not saying is that your pain, especially if you've gone through something really serious, something really traumatic, I'm not saying that your pain that you've gone through is some kind of collateral damage that God had to use in order to bring about some greater good for the world. Like, you're not a pawn in some chessboard, and God's up there moving you, this pawn, and saying, well, I guess I've got to sacrifice this one in order to win the game. That's not how God works. What I'm saying is, is that even in the times when we are most in pain, where it seems to be the most suffering, God is powerful enough to not let evil have the final say. Our God is sovereign enough that he is able to bring good even out of the most twisted situations because that's just how powerful he is. One of the ways that we can practice gratitude in the midst of serious suffering is by trying to find clues or hints of what that blessing is that God is trying to bring out of the suffering. Sometimes it can be really hard. 
But normally, if you look hard enough, in most situations, you can find it if you look hard enough. One of the, the best examples that I've seen of this is Corey and Betsy Ten Boom. Has anyone heard of these sisters before? Okay, a few, a few hands. Yeah, so these sisters are incredible. They were two Protestant uh, sisters who lived in Holland during World War II. And their family hid Jewish people in their home while the Nazis were rounding them up. And eventually they were caught. And their father died in prison, and the two sisters were shipped off to a concentration camp. And when they arrived at the concentration camp and they were shown to the barracks where they would live for the time when they were in the camp, they were appalled by what they saw. Hundreds of women had been crammed into these overcrowded uh, barracks, these warehouses essentially, uh, and they were sleeping in bunk beds where they were wedged so tightly together with nothing but a little bit of straw to cover them. And so the very first night when they laid down to sleep, as they lay in the straw, they felt little things crawling all over them and beginning to bite them. And Corey, who is a little bit more of a firecracker than her sister Betsy, she stands up and she says, fleas, this whole place is infested with fleas. How are we supposed to live in a place like this? And Betsy, who is normally a lot more peaceful if you read their story, she's able to pull out a Bible that she was able to smuggle into the camp. And she says, Corey, let's pray. And they opened up to that first passage that I read from Thessalonians, give thanks in all circumstances. And Betsy points at the page and she says, well, you heard God. Let's give him thanks for the circumstances we find ourselves in. Let's try and find the blessings in this. Corey's like, I guess. I identify much more with Corey in many ways. <laughs> Betsy says, let's thank God that, that we're not separated. That we get to stay together. Corey's like, okay, I can thank God for that. Thank you, God, for that. Betsy says, let's thank him that we were able to smuggle in a Bible, that no guard searched us when we came in. Okay, I can thank God for that. And then Betsy says, and God, I want to thank you for these fleas. And Corey, who's starting to calm down, says, are you kidding? No, no way. There's no way I'm thanking God for these fleas. There is nothing good about them. I'm not doing it. And Betsy said, Corey... God says in all circumstances, these fleas are a part of our circumstances. We're thanking God for the fleas. So Corey said, okay, thank you, God, for the fleas. <laughs> so as time passed, these sisters, they're awesome. They began help holding Bible studies in their barracks. And they were introducing women who hadn't met Jesus yet to Jesus. And there were salvations and conversions happening inside that barracks, inside one of the worst places in human history. God's grace was moving. And they were never investigated. The guards never came into their barracks. And Corey overheard the reason why. They didn't want to come where the fleas were. They didn't want to come where the fleas were. That is an example of how God is able to bring good out of the most evil situation we can even imagine. Now, what Corey and Betsy were doing, that wasn't some kind of naive optimism. They weren't looking for some silver lining somewhere. They were being authentically grateful to God for placing them where they were in order to do what he had called them to do. And sometimes we can't find a silver lining. Sometimes we can't find that good thing, that blessing that God is doing. And so in situations like that, when we have those fleas, we need to thank God for the suffering himself and hope in him that he's going to work it out. This is part of the mystery of God's will, that God allows suffering to come into our life in order to make us a saint. And we might not ever realize, even in this life, how that happens. We might not realize it until heaven, or, or until a couple years in the future. But he is faithful. He's trustworthy, and so we can thank him in the midst of our suffering. I was uh, once in a hospital because, uh, as part of my seminary formation, I was uh, kind of like a chaplain, and so I would go from room to room and just cold call people and, you know, hello, is it okay if I come in and talk with you for a little bit? Do you want prayer for something? And just see where it went and talking with a bunch of different people, a bunch of different backgrounds. And obviously a hospital is a place that is filled with suffering. 
and a lot of suffering in hospitals. And there was this one lady, I'll never forget, I was talking with her. She was a Protestant lady, very faithful, was totally open to prayer. And she was complaining to me, though, about how much pain she was in. And she was frustrated. She was saying to me, how come God hasn't healed me yet? What's he doing? I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm in so much pain, why isn't he doing something about it? And it wasn't part of her theology, but I started to explain to her how Jesus' suffering on the cross had won her salvation. And that part she knew, she was very aware of that. And I said, you know, when he was on that cross and he was suffering, he was thinking of you. And maybe in some mysterious way, he is calling you to suffer alongside him. And if you unite your suffering to his on the cross, he can bring about salvation for the family and friends that you were telling me about who don't yet know the Lord. And she began to cry. She'd never had her suffering make sense before. No one had ever explained that to her. And for the first time since her stay in the hospital, she was able to give thanks to God for the fact that she was in pain. Because her suffering now had meaning. There was a redemptive aspect to it. And so my encouragement to you is trust in God. Look for even a shred of good in what is happening and thank him for that. And even if you can't find that, thank him in advance, as Blessed Solana's case he would say. Thank him in advance for what he's doing with it to make you a saint. One of the best examples that I've ever heard of a woman who trusted in God and thanked him even though she didn't see the fruits of her suffering until many years in the future, was St. Josephine Bikita. I don't know if you know who she is, but if you don't, you really should develop a relationship with her. She is a pretty amazing saint. And she was born in Sudan. She was uh, born with the name Bikita uh, in a pagan village. No uh, introduction to Christianity, didn't know any missionaries. And when she was just a little girl, she was kidnapped by Arabic slave traders, and she was sold to different masters all over Africa and in the Middle East. And she had a terrible time, obviously, being treated as property. Uh, Her human dignity was not respected in any way. She was beaten, she was abused, she was tortured. Uh, Eventually, she was sold to an Italian man who brought her back to Italy. She was freed there. And it was there in Italy that she first encountered people who shared the gospel of Jesus with her. And she gave her life to the Lord. She was baptized, became a Catholic, and eventually she became a nun. Now, because she was from Africa, missionaries from all over the place would come to her and talk with Sister Josephine Makita. What should we know about going into Africa? What should we know about the culture? And they often asked her the question, what would you say to those people? who abducted you from your family, who you never saw again, who tortured you, who treated you like like a piece of property. And this is what she said, and it wrecks me every time I read it. She said, if I met the slave traders who kidnapped and tortured me, I would kneel down and kiss their hands. Thanks to them, I have received the gift of the faith. If I would stay and kneel down all of my life, I will never be able to express enough my gratitude towards the good Lord. That's powerful. If I have a tenth of the gratitude that this woman has, I'm pretty much guaranteed to be a saint. This was a holy woman. It punches me right in the gut. She is grateful in all circumstances. She is fulfilling what Thessalonians is talking about because she has an eternal perspective. She's not focusing on this world. She's focusing on the next world and she's seeing all of her sufferings in this world are gone like that in view of eternity, in view of the glory that's coming. And so she's able to thank God that she was able to encounter Jesus in the midst of all of this. And I think that that's the real key to the virtue of gratitude, is to approach our sufferings from the, the knowledge that we're not made for this world, that every joy and every sorrow in this world is passing away, and it's passing away quickly. We're not here for a long time. And we are awaiting the joy that is coming for us in the next life. 
God has saved us. Sometimes we as Catholics can pass over this super quickly. God has saved us. But if we reflect on what that means, what we have been saved from, gratitude should just pour out of us every single second of the day. We have been saved by Jesus. We who had turned away from God in our own ways, in our own sin, we had chosen things that were not God. We had walked away from him. But he was not content to leave us in that place. And he sent what was most precious of his. He sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to come to earth, to live amongst us, to die for us on that blood-soaked cross on Calvary so that he could get you back. That's what God did. And because of that, when Jesus rose from the dead, when he conquered death, he conquered your death. He conquered your sin. He conquered the fact that you don't have to go to hell anymore. If you have faith in Jesus, if you turn your life over to him, if you repent, heaven is open to you. Your heavenly father who loves you, who has loved you from all eternity, loved you before you were even conceived, and has saw you and chosen you, he has heaven open to you. And he is so excited to have you come and be with him there. Just ama imagine how amazing heaven is going to be. We'll be able to meet St. Ignatius Loyola and St. Josephine Bakita and Corey and Betsy. We'll be able to talk with, with Mary. And we'll be able to see God for who he is face to face. In Revelations, there's this description of heaven. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. There shall be no more mourning or crying or pain, for the former things have passed away. Guys, this world is not lasting. It's passing away. And so we can give thanks literally every second of the day, no matter what we're going through, because soon we're going home. And we can thank God and say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for your blood, which bought me back. Thank you for the gift of salvation, which I could never earn on my own, but I accept it as a free gift. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is truly a way to be grateful in all circumstances. We can be thankful to God for the blessings he gives us uh, in the good times. We can be thankful for the shreds of blessing that we can find in the bad times. But above all, Every single day, we can be thankful that we are redeemed, that we belong to God, that we're his children, his beloved children, and one day we get to go to heaven. And so with all of that in mind, what I'm going to do right now is just invite uh, my brother, JP. He's a member of the Companions of the Cross as well. And he's going to uh, lead us in a prayer here. Uh, and it's going to be through singing. So, um, you know, I hope you brought your singing voices. When I was getting ready for this talk, I was listening to a song called I Thank God that, you know, pumped me up, you know. I don't know if you've heard of Maverick City, but uh, they have this amazing song called I Thank God. And if you're ever feeling difficult to praise God, to thank God, I highly advise you to listen to it and just give yourself over to God. And so what I'm going to get JP to do is come up here. Uh, lead us in a song of worship, and I invite you to really sing along, even if you don't have the best voice. This might be not something that you normally do after dinner, uh, but uh, we'll, help, uh, we'll help get that pie settled. And, um, and yeah, just, just use this song as an opportunity to really thank God. To really, you know, uh, open up this Thanksgiving season, which is going to be upon us very soon, to thank Him in advance for what He's going to do, what He has done, and what he will do. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to JP. And thanks so much for, for inviting me, for having us here. Um, we'll be here afterwards to answer any questions you have about anything. It doesn't have to be about Thanksgiving, but uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. God bless.
you won't line up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. My apologies. Uh, we are utilizing our text question feature. So if you do have a question for Isaac, we have a, we have about 11 minutes before we go into group discussion. Uh, so the number to text your question to is 313-483-7272. Once again, 313-483-7272. Seven two. Give you a few minutes to submit your questions. And if your question does not get answered like Isaac said if he will be around after his after the event to answer any questions that go unanswered. Just while you're thinking as well um, JP and I are like we said we're going to be around for a little bit so if anyone needs prayer for anything as well we're open to praying with people afterwards uh, if anyone needs anything um, doesn't have to be about gratitude again, nor do the questions, but uh, we're going to be open. We'll find, we'll find some way to do that. <laughs> okay, so here's a question, Isaac. What's an example in your own life about how you have found God's plan and consolation in suffering? Okay, sure. So one thing that comes to mind is... Um, when I was uh, applying for seminary, uh, I was in university, and uh, I was pretty selfish. I, I wanted uh, to become a priest on my own terms, so I kind of waited. Um, I waited until I had a bunch of fun, and I'm like, well, eventually I'll become a priest one day, like once I, you know, kind of partied up a little bit first. And, uh, and then when I thought I was good and ready, I applied to the seminary. And, uh, you know, again, kind of thinking, like, of course they're going to accept me. Isn't the church desperate for priests? Like, don't they, you know, this is going to be easy. Uh, and it wasn't, because I actually got rejected. 
I got rejected the first time I applied. <laughs> Which was very wise of the priests, by the way. I would not have accepted me either. Um, so, man, so, and this was, a, this led to some suffering for me because um, suddenly the rug was taken out from under my feet. Here I was, I was trying to serve the Lord in my own way and, and trying to apply and suddenly to be told, yeah, we don't think you're ready. We don't think you're mature enough to become a priest. Um, go back to school and or do something. We don't even care if you go back to school, but go and do something um, and kind of get some more life experience. And uh, it took the rug out from under me because I was thinking, well, now what do I do with my life? Like, maybe I won't become a priest and I have to change all of my life goals. And, and so that whole year was a year of a lot of growth, um, a lot of soul searching. And I actually was wondering, like, where is God in all of this? Like, how could God not want another priest? Like, how does, what, what, what is God doing with this? And that summer, I was able to uh, have an experience in confession that changed my life and uh, made it much more easy for me to enter seminary because up until that point, I had actually been lying in confession for years. I had been hiding sins from the priest. I was telling him only things that I wanted him to hear because I was so full of myself that I wanted to look good even before um, priests and confessionals. I was lying to God. And so I was able that summer to go to confession for real for the first time in many years. And I was just wrecked by the love and the mercy of God. I cried all the way home because I was authentic and honest with the priest and I was honest with the Lord. And from that space of freedom that came to me from that confession, I was able to reapply the next year, and it's really cool. There was almost like a spiritual release because they noticed a difference in me. They noticed a change in me when I came back, and uh, and I was accepted. So God was able to use what was painful, and even that confession in and of itself was painful to be that honest, um, but he used it for his glory, and he used it to make me ready to become a priest in seminary uh, because I honestly think that if I joined seminary, I was planning on lying about a lot of things going in and just, you know, continuing my, my fake two-faced superficial life, and uh, the Lord broke that down in me, and uh, I wouldn't be here without that. I would have uh, left or been kicked out long before. So at this point, that's the only question I've received so far via the text message. If you have one, uh, raise your hand, speak up. <laughs> if anyone has any questions. Yes. Yeah, so I forgot the number. I'm not going to lie to you. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to ask again. Um, but the question I have for you is, uh, you know, with gratitude, I, I've heard this before where it came down to, like, actually journaling at the end of the day. Have you ever done anything like that where you journal at the end of the day for Thanksgiving? I, I just popped in my mind. I remember hearing something like that years ago. And I laughed at the idea of it years ago, but I can't believe it's still stuck in the back of my mind. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I do journal often in prayer. Uh, I don't pray at the end of the day, but I journal in prayer because um, I forget easily, and um, God wants me to remember things and to be able to track them. And so I, I definitely, I keep a prayer journal. I write in it. I try and write in every every day and write down what the Lord is saying and uh, what He's doing in prayer. Um, but I don't do that at the end of the day. I wouldn't say it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. Um, at the end of the day, though, um, St. Ignatius of Loyola, I mentioned, uh, has his spiritual examine. And if you don't do that at the end of your day, it's very helpful. My spiritual director is a Jesuit, and he just um, told me to get more serious about doing that. And so I'm trying to do that every single night. And uh, basically, it's looking over your whole day and seeing where you need to thank God, where God was moving, what you need to repent of, um, and also to focus on one uh, thing that he was trying to teach you. And uh, you can look it up online, uh, you know, St. Uh, Ignatius Loyola's Examine. And uh, it's something similar. And if you if something comes up, yeah, write it down. Put it in your prayer journal so you, so you remember. Okay, uh, this question probably could be for both you and uh, JP. Favorite hockey team? Montreal Canadiens. <laughs> no Canadians fans? Not even one? I work for Canadians. You work for Canadians? I work for Canadians. Yeah. 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 Ye
I know. I accept that. I accept that. <laughs> if it makes you feel better, I don't follow hockey at all. I mean, we just went a little bit farther than you guys last. Time. Was it 94 your last cup? <laughs> that was the year I was born. It was a blessed year. <laughs> what was your favorite team? Are you an Ottawa fan? Yeah. He's an Ottawa Senators fan. Uh, <laughs> no booze? Come on. What about the Nordiques? You a Nordiques fan? I don't know who they are. <laughs> wow. wow. It's, it's a, they don't exist anymore. Quebec City? Les Quebecois. Oh. Nordiques moved to Colorado. They are the Colorado Avalanche now. Okay. There you go. See, I'm a terrible Canadian. I really am. I'm from Canada, by the way, so um, I'm a terrible Canadian. I don't know too much about Quebec. Yeah. I don't even speak French. And I didn't start playing hockey until I came to the U.S. That's such a fun. How do you spell Giroux? Sorry? How do you spell Giroux? You Charlie's brother? No. <laughs> I'm a classic Charlie. He's in my class. <laughs> well, uh, yes, Jonathan. So, where can we see the lessons of gratitude in the Book of Job? Mm. Book of Job. We have busted out. <laughs> the Book of Job, possibly after Lamentations, the most dismal book in the Bible. Um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> I took a class on it. Okay. Maybe you can answer this better than me. I mean, uh, other than what I could just say something generic about Chapter it. Chapter 40 should be a good one. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the end, despite his suffering, things work out for him in the end, and God is able to bring back all that he lost and then add to it. And so there's a lesson in there about being faithful to God and persevering throughout. I don't know if Job was thanking God, but maybe he was. JP, you want to wanna chat about it? Thing that I think that Job was very authentic. The whole entire time. When he was said, he told God he was said. When he was mad, he told him. When he was upset, he told him. So he was authentic. And his friends were inauthentic, and that's why God dismissed them. Mm. So he was authentic the whole time. I like that. Yeah. I mean, at, at the end of the book, there's this uh, situation where he prays for his friends, um, kind of in relation to that. And it said that God accepted his prayer. Um, because he's praying for his yeah, bad friends. Hopefully you guys don't have any bad friends. But you can still pray for them and thank God for them. Uh, and it, it says that God restored um, he, God restored all of his uh, belongings, everything he had. Um, it says in uh, 42, uh, verse 10, And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And it said that, um, uh, just a little bit after that, he uh, God comforted him, comfort, comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had allowed um, in his life. So, yeah, uh, maybe that helps a little bit. But... Thank you. So let's thank Isaac for joining us tonight. And <laughs> And Isaac, as a token of our appreciation for you coming, we present you with a statue of our patron, St. Joseph. Isaac mentioned in his little testimony about going to confession and lying about it, uh, lying about his sins. Uh, so I just wanted to mention real quick because it might be helpful that all of us in this room know and also tell others because this actually happens more often than we think. But if you do lie in confession, that makes it invalid and a sacrilege. So you're adding another sin on top of lying. So it, it would be useful <laughs> to know that. because some, some people don't know that. And so and what that does, actually, if you make that invalid and a sacrilege and you don't confess that later on, it also affects the way that all of your sacraments, including the Blessed Sacrament, the, the reception of communion, 
becomes uh, basically ineffective in you because you you have a major block in your spiritual life. So I just wanted to mention that because I, it's actually more common than we think. And sometimes the Catholics go along, go along their lives for years. I've, I've met someone 10 years kind of like with this hiding this one sin from younger days, you know, kind of like something really difficult to admit and didn't see any change uh, or growth in their life or in relation to, uh, to, to, the, to the Lord in their lives. And then when they finally confessed that, everything just broke. Uh, broke through and it, it literally changed their lives. So yeah, I just figured I'll mention that. Uh, does anybody have any questions about that? Make sense? Okay, cool. <laughs>